Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes Jesus just doesn't act like we would expect him to. In today's Gospel reading, for instance, Jesus seems to be rather aloof, perhaps even downright mean. A woman comes to him asking for his help in healing her daughter's demonic affliction. At first, Jesus simply ignores this Gentile woman. But she follows Jesus and his disciples, continuing to beg for his help. The disciples are quick to reach the limit of their patience, and they ask Jesus to send her away quickly. And we expect Jesus to chastise his disciples for their uncaring attitude towards this woman. But instead, Jesus seems to agree with them asserting that he came to serve the people of Israel and not the Gentile nations. Still, the woman persists, and right at the point at which we expect Jesus' demeanor to soften and he resolve to help her, he instead tells her that she is little more than a Gentile dog. Such comments would have polarized the crowd of people that were following Jesus that day. He was in the area of Tyre, a region on the far northern outskirts of the Promised Land. It was an area that was populated by a healthy mix of Greek-speaking pagans and a few Hebrew people. Matthew, however, doesn't pull any punches. He gets right to the point of this woman's ancestry. He calls her simply a Canaanite. The Canaanites, you see, were idolaters, people who had long ago abandoned the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to that day, Israelites simply did not mix with Canaanites. So up to this point in our story, Jesus has taken a clear side in this conflict. His comments and his treatment of this Canaanite woman must have appeased those disciples and the Jews that were following him that day. Yeah, that's right, they must have thought. Go ahead and call her a Gentile dog. We don't got time for her nonsense. You mean to tell me that an idol worshiper got her daughter possessed by a demon? Ha! No surprise there. She's getting what she deserves. Come on, Jesus, let's move on to more important things. And yet this woman is undeterred. She replies to our Lord, Yes, I am an unworthy dog. But even the dogs are blessed with the scraps that fall from the master's table. At this point, Jesus stops, praises the woman for her great faith, and he heals her daughter instantly. For us, while we ended up where we thought we should in this account, how we got there is a bit strange. Jesus doesn't seem to be acting like we expect him to. Jesus doesn't seem to be acting like the Savior of the entire world. Or does he? At first glance, it appears that Jesus had to be convinced of this woman's faith before he would help her. That he has resolved pretty much to just ignore her and when confronted even put her down as a Gentile idolater. That is until she shocks and surprises him by having faith in who he is. Then Jesus, seeing her faith, changes his mind and then he helps her. It may seem that way at first glance. And this is the kind of faith that many are selling in our world out there today. That the idea that if you just try hard enough, just do well enough, just persist long enough, eventually Jesus will give in and give you what you want. It's called prosperity theology. And it's all over the place. Unfortunately, it's not biblical. And it's simply not true. Look at our text for this story again. Jesus is not surprised by this woman's faith. His exclamation of, Oh woman, great is your faith, is not one of bewilderment, but rather one of praise. 
For from the moment that that woman calls out to Jesus from the crowd, he knows that she knows who he really is. For she addresses him out of the crowd, O Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, the Jews, even the Jews in Jesus' own hometown, only knew Jesus as the son of Joseph, the carpenter. And when Jesus presented himself as being something more, they mocked him out of town. But this Canaanite woman knows his true kingly identity. And she doesn't stop there. Look what she then asks of him. Please, heal my daughter who is oppressed by a demon. This is not a mere broken leg. This is not blind eyes that she is asking Jesus to fix. This is a spiritual problem of metaphysical proportions. Only God himself can fix this issue. And this woman knows it and believes it. And Jesus knows that she knows it from the very beginning when she calls out for mercy from the crowd. So why torture her then? Why humiliate her in front of all these people? If Jesus knows her faith from the very beginning, why make her prove it in front of the disciples and the gathered crowd? For their benefit. That's why. This woman may not have realized it, but she was to become an inspiration for millions of people to follow. Millions of people in her own time and in our time that happen to not be of Israelite descent. You see, in helping this Canaanite woman, Jesus shows that everyone, that while his earthly redemption started with God's chosen people of Israel, his benefits of his victory over sin, death, and the devil are meant for all people who trust in him. Jew and Gentile alike. You and me alike. We are that Canaanite woman. Well, we don't deserve anything from our master's table. We are idolaters, every one of us. For we busy ourselves and concern ourselves with our time, our money, our family, our friends, our hobbies, our interests, our ideas. It's all about us. The first commandment is always our worst commandment because we will daily worship more of ourselves than we will ever worship of our God. And yet, like today, we come before our God still and we expect great and abundant things from Him. Why? Because He has promised to deliver. That's why. And it's because of who he is. That is the faith in him that we have. You see, dear friends, God's love for you exists in this. That while you are still sinning, God has already provided for you. For he has given you faith in his Son. Delivered it to you from little on through holy baptism and the instruction of your parents, your godparents, your grandparents. He has watered and grown that faith by your hearing of the word in church, maybe at school, and hopefully at home. He knows your faith the same way he knew the faith of that Canaanite woman. He knows your faith because he has given it to you. And he knows your redemption because he has won it for you. Because he has nailed it to the cross for you. Because he has left it lying in the tomb for you. We are not worthy of this on our own merit. But God has made us worthy through the life, the death, and the resurrection of his Son. And so he continues to provide for you even before, even without your prayers. For he has promised to deliver you, and he has already delivered his Son for you. So now the same question arises for us. Why then, if he knows our faith, does he let us suffer? 
If He loves you and will provide what is best for you, then why does He let you suffer and struggle like that Canaanite woman? For the same reason. For the benefit of others. That's why. You see, God knows that even while you suffer here and now, you are not lost to Him. God knows that even should your life on this earth come to an end, that you already have another victorious life waiting to be lived with Him for all eternity. He knows that death is not your defeat. In fact, it is part of the greatest blessing that He can bestow. For it is by death in this world that He gives eternal life in the next. It is by death that He puts an end to death. And so He lets suffering visit His children. For by that suffering, others may see the glory of the Lord revealed in the pains and the tragedies of this life. By us taking up our cross and following our Savior through this world of pain and persecution, death and disease, those who do not yet know Jesus Christ might be led to follow Him as well. For they will see your faith. They will see your joy in pain. They will see your confidence in uncertainty. They will see your victory in defeat. They will see your Jesus shining forth above all the idols of this world. And they will remark, great is your faith. And the Holy Spirit will work to create that same faith in them that they may have what you have. And so our Lord's desire that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth might be realized and He might have mercy on us all. But this does not make life easy. In fact, it most often tears your guts out. But it does make life faithful. For we continually recognize our inability to save ourselves. We continually recognize our inability to control all things. And so we must in turn leave all things to God's direction. And He does not always act the way that we expect Him to or in the ways that we want Him to. But He knows all. He sees all and He knows how best to provide for us all, both in this life and in the life yet to come. So dear friends, maybe you're suffering today. Maybe you're praying for a miracle. Maybe you're waiting to receive from God great and abundant things. Maybe you're still waiting. Maybe you're afraid to even ask Him because you feel too unworthy. Maybe at this point, you'd simply be happy with a few scraps from his table. Wherever you are, you need to know this. God has not abandoned you. He has not rejected you. He is not ignoring you any more than he was ignoring that Canaanite woman. Instead, he has planned for you. He has provided for you. He has bled and died for you. He has it all figured out for you. And if you could see it through His eyes, it would all make sense to you. For His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In His world, suffering is faithfulness. In His world, humiliation is blessing. In His world, death is life. It looks backwards to us only because we're looking at it from the wrong side of the grave. Here we see only dimly, but there we will see all things clearly. But until that day, what is clear to us is what He has revealed to us in His Word. The same thing He revealed to that Canaanite woman and revealed to the entire crowd following her that day. Our God does not cast off any who have faith in Jesus Christ. And so whether He heals us in this life or the next, He will set all things right. And no one, not by birth, 
not by their sin, is so unworthy that God does not desire them. For he gave his life for us all, so that all who trust in him will be saved. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.